moving on. Okay, so time for ARC Fellowship again. This is the last ARC Fellowship for a fortnight next weekend because we'll be involved with the baptism. But the uh, dedication of Zachariah is over there, you can't see on the camera. Uh, it's not, the logistics don't really work to try and rush back here and then do ARC as well. So Zachariah's special day will be our, our meeting together next week. So this week is part one of two parts. So you'll have a whole fortnight to get your head around this and then we'll move on to part two. But before we begin, we will go into prayer. Do you want to be the one to pray? So we have a we have a situation at the moment, a friend of these not saved as far as we know, is dying right this minute in intensive care from really advanced cancer. Nevertheless, isn't Jesus the one who saved the criminal on the cross at his side, even at the last minute? While there's breath, there's life. While there's breath, there's hope. Oh, Genesis 1. Let there be light, and lo, there was. So uh, I'll pray, I'll pray, and then Dee, you pray, and then we'll be in agreement with you. Father, we thank you. We come before you. We remember the words of your son. He said, wherever two or three of you are gathered there in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So we welcome you, Lord. We welcome you by the presence of Ruach HaKodesh, your spirit, the spirit of truth. Brings to mind all that you have said and leads us in all truth. Who defends your Shem among us and defends your word. We remember, Lord, your mercy for the criminal on the cross. Who could do nothing? He was in his last moment. Yeah, you saved him. So hear the words of our sister D. She prays for another who we want to be a sister in the kingdom to come. We ask for the forgiveness of her sin. You, O oh Lord, who are merciful. You who sees and knows nothing is hidden from you. Nevertheless, Lord, here is our petition. Hear D pray, Lord, and know that we agree we come together as a body for this woman though we don't know her and we have not seen her you know her and you see her and hear us now Lord as we pray Lord you created Charlie Amen. so you know her yes Lord Lord I thank you for her and I thank you that we can come together before you in your mercy yes Lord for the mercy we ask for full salvation and showing this night, Lord. Mm -hmm. And Lord, I thank you that she had a grandmother that prayed, a mm -hmm. grandmother that was a Christian. Yes, Lord. And I know that grandmother prayed for all of her grandchildren. So I remind you, Lord, of this grandmother and the prayers. And we ask that you would save Shalane completely, body, soul, and spirit, Lord. Yes, Lord. So when her time comes, Lord, she would be at peace with you and she would know you. We thank you for showing me. And I ask you to bring your comfort of Ruth Hakodesh, the living and the mother, yes. and to my friend Tiny, and the rest of the siblings, Lord. Yes. We thank you for who you are, your shame. And in my everything, thank you, your shame. Amen. Amen. Lord, I thank you. You are God who keeps his word. You are the upholder of oaths and the keeper of promises. You cannot be persuaded to sin. You cannot be persuaded to abandon the covenant that you have made with man, sealed by the blood of your son. So we commend this soul, this life, into your hands, knowing that you are her only hope. Nevertheless, Lord, we trust you that you will do what is right and good and just, that you work all things together for the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose, for your glory and for your name's sake. For thee and for those who know and love this woman, 
in a more intimate way, Lord, a, a more close relationship than we have. We pray and ask that you encompass them about with your peace, that you overwhelm them with your presence, and that you counsel them, Lord, with your word, that you put your word in their mouths and give them your testimony. And the days ahead and even in the night, and even when there are many tears, Lord, even then, shine so that your righteous cause will prevail. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Got the shakes now. There was something going on there. Yeah. Yeah. I know. It's like, like sorry, on the camera. It's a bit hot here. <laughs> so, if you want to. Mm. Okay, so our topic is entitled, this is part one of two parts, it's entitled Sifting, and then on part two, How the Antichrist Comes. So we're going to understand the concept of God sifting people, and nations, and creation. And next time, part two, we'll focus more on how does Antichrist come? How does he get away with what he gets away with based on Israel's history and on the scriptures? I'm going to fly through some of the pages quite quick because I'm more for reading at home. So uh, the summary of page one is this. When I, I've told you this a few times before, but sometimes when I, when I sit down to write a message, the Lord will give me something that's generally true. You know, so it's like a general truth that he needs us to know adding to the foundations. But sometimes, and tonight is such an occasion, it's something specific. And it says in the scripture concerning our enemy that he was defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of the saints, the word of their testimony. Whose testimony? You and me. Why? How could that be? Well, what is Satan's primary weapon? What material does he make all his weapons out of? Lies, deceit, corruption, deception, right? So when we testify, what is the best answer to a lie? Truth. Truth. What is the best answer to deception? Truth. You know? Someone's trying to con your best friend. You're going to have a helpful, polite word about the truth with them, and then if they don't listen, well, you throw them out the door, don't you? That's what God does. When the truth is not listened to, when he's done all the talking, there's a point where to save his people, he'll take the liar by the neck and deal with them. Okay? Keep that in mind as we look here. So tonight, I'm going to explain to you what you're likely to experience in the days ahead, and the months ahead, and the years ahead. Actually experience and see with your own eyes. And as we've been saying over the last few weeks, the key to not losing your salvation is right expectation. If you know what to expect, if you can believe God, not just believe in God, remember, but believe God, you will not be shaken when the things God says must happen, happen. Whereas everyone else will be going, oh, what's happening, what's happening? Like it's happening in the States at the moment where no one can believe that, you know, a guy's got Alzheimer's and has been caught in so many crooked deals taking money from China, is suddenly going to be president by the South Korea. You think, how? That's so irrational. It is irrational. Because it's not, a, why is it happening? It's judgment. It's spiritual. But if you don't understand that these things are what the scripture says will happen, you will be just left in a flat spoon, your world will unravel, and you won't be able to comprehend. And most important of all, you'll be saying, 
Where did God go? Where did Jesus go? When it looks like the enemy is winning. I emphasise looks like the enemy is winning. Because as we've been talking about a lot lately, when God causes these things and it's judgment, he uses a demonic agency, but he sends it. He sends it. It's his judgment. He sends it. So who's in charge? Him. Who's winning? Him. Whose will is being done? His. If you can't understand that, then you'll end up crumbling, thinking that the enemy has somehow managed to be defeating Jesus after all. That's what Satan thinks he's doing. You know, Satan's so good at lying that he's actually got himself convinced <laughs> that he might win. You know? No. So when I bring the message tonight, to, because it needs to be the word of my testimony, I've made it personal to bring some these truths out, but adding personal testimony from it, right? So most of you know that I never intended to be a pastor. In fact, truth be known, I still am slightly baffled what I'm doing here. <laughs> you know? For me, I thought I would work with alcoholics and drug addicts and people like that. And as far as I was concerned, I should be in the Salvation Army and that should be the best place for me because they put action to the words. Except after a few years, I had this problem and I, I'm saying this for the sake of the camera, most of you know this already. Except when I studied at home because I was single, and you know, when you're single, you go all the time, so you you can read the Bible a lot, like I did. And I, I had this problem because what I read was not the same as what I was being told at church, and what I read was not the same as what I saw being done. So I was confused. So I went. And I asked questions like you do, like a child does, thinking I must have just not understood the scripture. Only to be basically chased away each time. That's when I had my first big encounter with God. That's when God really became personal to me. And I'll explain that again in a minute. But he asked me, to agape somebody that I didn't like. But I thought, oh yeah, I can do that. And besides, I'd read that. We're going to see it's right there in the middle of page one, Matthew 5. Put my glasses on. Because it's an instruction, right? So Jesus says, Matthew 5, verse 43, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Verse 46 is one you need to memorize. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? And not even the tax collectors doing that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even the pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. In Hebrew understanding, when it says, so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, it's a Hebrew way of saying that you may be just like him. Remember what we did last week? How God doesn't act because of us, he acts in spite of us. He bases his actions on his own character, not ours, thank God. Otherwise, we'd be little piles of ash already. You know? 
So this is what this is saying. Jesus says, if you only love those who love you back, if you only, you know, spend time with those who make you happy, if you only invest in those who invest more back, how are you any different from the world? Because, frankly, that's how the world chooses its friends. You, if you have a worldly friend and they're really stuck on you, you know what's going on in their mind? They see you as the answer to something they think they need. Unsaved people are all about self. And since, oh, one for Joseph, since he's somehow not married yet, boyfriends and girlfriends in the world, how did they choose each other? With the eyes. Oh, he's got it. So, with the eyes, you haven't even met the person, you don't know anything about them, you certainly don't know them in any kind of deep way, and yet, you're already thinking, woohoo, this is the girl for me. What part of that has got anything to do with a girl? Nothing. You're only thinking about yourself. You're only thinking about how she can meet your agenda. Even before you've even spoken to her. That's how the world works. The world is greedy and self-centered and only relates to other people to get its own needs met. Most human relationships are based on mutual theft. You're always trying to get off the other person what you think you need. And they're trying to get off you what they think they need, and that's why most relationships are a kind of battle. I used to call it a pumping contest. So imagine two half-full buckets meet, and they see each other and go, there's the other half of my bucket. The water I'm missing is in that bucket. So you come up, the two buckets say, hi, hi, you look great. Can I just like pump a bit of water out of you? And they're like, yeah, sure, sure. But can I pump a bit of water out of you? Both only want to empty the other one to fill themselves up. But because they're both pumping, the relationship is a pumping contest. It's exhausting. And eventually, one will win at the death of the other one. That is your classic boyfriend and girlfriend. That is your classic, met her in the pub, I was a bit drunk, but a week later we were married. You know, which you might laugh, but that's how many how many New Zealand couples that you know, like heaps. You know? Well, what is God's version? God's version is not looking for the person that can complete you. It's looking for the person that you can complete that you can be, you can bring something to and you can make them more. You are thinking about them. You are deciding if they're the right person based on whether you are the right person for them, not whether they're the right person for you. Does that make sense? It's not a pumping contest, it's a giving away contest. You know? It's a self-sacrificial contest in a sense. But because you're mutually building each other up, it doesn't feel like competition. It's not exhausting. It's cooperative. <coughs> Make sense? Maggie's over there thinking, yeah, that's me. I'll give you the badge after. That's what Jesus is saying here. If all you do is you only love those you think you can get what you want out of, those that love you back, they're no different than the pagan world. You're not, you're not holy. Remember, holy means set apart. You're not set apart. You're the same. You're just the world with a Jesus sticker on you. You understand? 
Very important here that you, that we remember that this word love is who anyone has it a guess which the Greek word is? Agape, yeah? Agape. So as I put in the next little bit underneath it, agape is not eros, got nothing to do with sexual attraction. So God was not asking me to be sexually attracted to anyone. And it's not filio, which is the love involved in friendship. Right? Well, you need to like them. You can love someone without liking them. You can agape them without filioing them or erosing them. Because agape gives, expecting nothing back. Agape gives because the giving is the right thing to do. Agape does what is right. Because agape is the love that Jesus refers to in John 14 when he says, if you love me, if you agape me, you will keep my teachings. And that whole part of John, for several chapters here, he repeats this over and over. Who wants the Holy Spirit in their life? You know, so people sing choruses saying, you know, oh, come Holy Spirit, you know, you know. Come Holy Spirit, come Spirit of God. Over and over they sing it. Sorry, I was giggling because I was thinking of times where I've been stuck in there thinking what's going on. Do you think the Holy Spirit comes on that basis? No. Jesus tells you in John, read it for yourselves from about chapter 9 on, he says, the one who loves me is the one that keeps my instruction and both I and the Father will make our dwelling with them. The Holy Spirit comes to the one who sets out to live by his instruction. Why? Well, he sent to help you accomplish it. He doesn't come for someone who just wants a Holy Spirit party but doesn't want to change. You know? So all of that chorus singing is pointless. Well, it's especially pointless if no one, is, if no one singing it has actually thought of the novel idea of actually believing God and doing what he says. Right? Very important to understand. So God wasn't asking me to like anybody. He wasn't asking me to be sexually attracted to anybody. And how did he make sure of that? Well, the person he asked me to agape was just awful. <laughs> really awful. So I had to learn how. Why did he ask me to do that, you might say. Fair question. Well, to accomplish it, I should point out that I was so in awe of God that I said yes without thinking. <laughs> you know, oops, because he then pointed me to the scripture where he says, let your yes be yes and your no, no, anything else is from the devil. Oh, whoops, right, covenant. So why did God do this? Well, because he needed me to not be another cardboard cutout Christian. He needed me to have to find out what does it mean and how do you do it? And it's only taken me 30 years to get through, you know, the first lesson. <laughs> it's not something that comes overnight, I can tell you. But it is what we're all supposed to do. You might think, oh, that's just you. You know, God didn't say that to me. Well, yes, he did. We just read it. We are all. He just made something specific so that I couldn't run and hide from it. So I would have to learn it. But actually, it's a general, so the, my personal testimony is specific, but it reflects a general truth. We are all commanded to agape the unlikable. Not the unlovable. No one is unlovable. But there's lots of people who are unlikable. And that's an important thing to understand. God does not ask you to pretend that they're not awful. You don't have to try and tell your emotions to be positive. 
That's what the world does. That's what silly humanists like our Prime Minister do. You know? Be nice. You can't keep that up for 10 minutes. If the person you're trying to be nice to is beating you with a stick or drives you insane every time, you know? You can't. If you're trying to run it on emotion, it'll last for five minutes. And then you'll end up like mentally exhausted, emotionally crippled, you know, because you think you're failing. Oh, Lord, I tried, but I just can't do it. What will he say? I didn't ask you to do that. I asked you to agape them. What does agape mean? Keep my teaching concerning it. What does that mean? Stand in the truth. Seek their repentance. Take away their ignorance. Seek their salvation. Why? Because of them? No. <laughs> what we learned last week. In reflection of me, in spite of them. In spite of them. If you wait for them to be worth saving, you won't mention Jesus to anybody. Because you'll never meet anyone worth saving. That's a fundamental of Christianity. All of all that short. There's no one worthy. Right? But we have to put this into practice. We have to put it into practice. Well, I learned something that like, you read and you think, oh yeah, that's interesting, but you don't realize how true it is until you obey. Jesus said, if they listen to me, they'll listen to you. But if they don't listen to you, it's because they won't listen to me either. The world, when he says the world, he means those not in the covenant. The world will hate you, just as it hated me. Christ, Christian means Christ-like. So when we fit in with the world, we can, you know, go along undercover. But when we at, when he pokes us to obey him, get ready for backlash. The world hates being told that it's sinful. Jesus said that to his disciples. I just paraphrase. He said, it's all very well for you. The world doesn't hate you, but it hates me because I convicted of sin. Why do they do that, by the way? Why do they get so anti? Well, it's human nature. The fallen mind always tells itself a lie that... If you shoot the messenger, the message will go away. <laughs> What's the weakness of that argument? It only goes away. It only goes away as long as it takes for news that you've shot the messenger to get back to the guy that actually sent the message. Then what will he do? You not only didn't listen to his message, you shot his servant. You know. The messenger is carrying someone else's message. So when they beat up the messenger, this is what when you understand what happened to the prophets in the Old Testament, and Jesus said the same thing will happen to you. In the Beatitudes, it says, Blessed are you when you all men hate you and revile you on account of your testimony. You will share in the reward of the prophets for the same thing that's happening to you has happened to them. Um, but it's human nature. They always think, ah, oh, shoot the messenger, and that's the end of it. The message will go away. Forgetting that how long does it take God to find out that they've done that? Zero time. Because nothing happens that he doesn't see it. Right? They are condemning themselves when they do that. Nevertheless, if you're the messenger, it doesn't make you any less shocked. So Jesus was warning us, when you obey me, you're going to get hurt by the world on occasion. But it's a privilege. You know? They're the ones in trouble. You're not in trouble for being shot. They're in trouble for shooting you. Does that make sense? Anyway, we move on. At the bottom of the page, I've said here, to agape your enemy is to... Stand in the truth, seeking their salvation and their repentance to be Christ-like toward them 
because of your loyalty to Jesus, nothing to do with what they're doing. Your motivation is Christ, to obey him, to agape him. Remember? So that means it doesn't matter what they're doing, you do what's right regardless of what they're doing. That's what drives them so nutty. The world is used to your behaviour being driven by what the other person's doing. Very different. But I experienced the most appalling abuse, unbelievable abuse in the church. You know, even threats on occasion, actual threats to me. You know, because I wouldn't shut up. I'd try and shut up, and then God would be like, Oi, oi, remember your promise? Oh, yes. What did you say? Okay. You know, and then I would speak up and then take another hiding. You know, why am I sharing that? Well, there's a golden rule you have to understand. If you suffer abuse, the temptation is to give in to your abuser and go along with the abuse. Right? That's the temptation. That's game over. That's game over you, because you're calling evil good. You know? Your own mind will collapse at that point and you'll become a slave to it and unable to escape. So, the first thing you don't do is leave the solid ground. And if staying on the solid ground causes you to receive bad treatment at the hands of those who don't want to hear, particularly if God sends you to a specific person about something you know you need to say and they don't want to hear it, you don't let their reaction have any say in your actions. You do it to obey the Lord because your reward doesn't come from them. Your reward comes from Him. Your allegiance is not to them. It comes to Him. And you do it in spite of them, not because of them. Because he'll probably send you to people that you don't like. I made the mistake of complaining to God about my new boss at work. Oh, Lord, I know you said love your enemies, but this guy, like that. And then next minute, knock, knock on my bedroom door. And it's my flatmate who's very discerning. And God used to speak to her a lot especially if I was trying not to listen. <laughs> and and she opens the door and says, God just woke me up and told me you have to pray for your boss. And I'm like, okay. I hadn't mentioned it to her, so I knew I was really God. So I asked God's blessing on him. I asked God to deal with him and to bless him, to save him. Next day I went to work, and like God's sense of humor, the first thing that happens in the morning, he comes into my office. And he was like a typhoon normally when he came into your office, you know, like all the furniture would be wrecked. And instead he goes, do you want to go for a drive, just you and me? And I'm thinking, oh, now what? The whole day I'm thinking, any minute, any minute. We went out the whole day and drove around and looked at stuff that we were financing and ate ice cream and lunch. And he talked about his dog, his kids. It's like being on holiday. And the whole time I'm waiting for the cyclone, never came, weirdest day. But he was like Mr. Nice. And the whole time I could sense God saying, who's in charge? Okay, <laughs> you're in charge, not my boss. You know, that's always stuck with me. If God allows you to suffer, it's to grow you. If God allows you to experience Christ-like experiences, remember, Christian means Christ-like. How did they treat him? Every Christian can be expected at least sometimes in their life to receive that same treatment from the same people. Who will that be? Pharisees. You know, religious people, meaning those who are following things made up by men, not the word of God. And occasionally the odd Roman, you know, but not that often. Usually it's a 
religious person that gives you grief, right? So don't be surprised when you have a Christ-like experience and certainly don't be put off, don't be discouraged. It is a privilege. It's a badge of belonging to share that experience with him, right? Turning over to page two. So the more I had this issue that when I was with God at home in my Bible, it said one thing, and when I was at church, they were teaching something else, and when I tried to speak up, I'd get a hiding. I got confused. I kept thinking, there's so many of them, and there's just one of me. <laughs> You know, you're human, you start to think, oh, maybe it's me that's wrong. So I prayed a really dangerous prayer, and I still pray it now, and I'm sharing it with you, because if you feel exceptionally brave, because <coughs> it takes a certain amount of bravery, it's on the top of page two, and you're welcome to borrow it. And I said to the Lord, Lord Jesus, by the spirit of truth, you promised would remind us of everything you have spoken and lead us in all truth. I ask in your name and do not refuse me because you promised we would have what we sought in your name. Give me the truth, no mixtures, no substitutes. At any cost, no matter how disturbing. Well, I had no idea how disturbing disturbing could be. Because everything that you see before you, everything that I'm able to do, everything that I'm able to share with you, came out of that. I made a decision to be loyal to him and to follow the truth, but he said, whatever that was, why was it disturbing? Because it put a giant bulldozer through like 80% of what I'd been taught at church to the point I couldn't stay there anymore. You know? Couldn't stay. Remember, we're told that those who perish, perish because they would not love the truth. They would not love the truth. So if you feel brave, and I hope you do, you're welcome to borrow that Truth is defined by the scripture, but to understand the scripture requires the Holy Spirit. It requires God to answer this prayer, and he will. It says, it says in the scripture, if any of you lack wisdom, ask for it, and it will be freely given by God. God wants us to understand, contrary to what some churches say. He wants us to understand. He didn't speak in riddles. You know, Actually, the scripture isn't... Don't you find the scripture, now that you understand it better, is quite rational. It doesn't require a lot of blind faith at all. So I thought, that's it. And I actually left the Salvation Army three times, I think. <laughs> Might be four. Because I don't even get to go away for a bit because poor God would like connect me again. Because of that promise. Because I started to understand that this single person that he asked me to, Agape, actually was just like the poster child of the whole place. So the problem wasn't just with that person, but with she was just a product of that place. So the real problem was the leaders, those that were teaching, the shepherds, you know? And then it got scarier because, although there seems, don't get me wrong, there's plenty of real Christians in the Sallies, just as there's plenty of real Christians in every church. I'm only talking about them because that's my personal story, right? I can't talk about another church because I wasn't in another church other than that one. But I've met plenty of people just like me who have the same story in different churches. One of the truths that 
Spirit led me to, and it's one that you'll have heard a million times from me, is that there's actually only one Jesus who is himself. I know that sounds obvious, but people don't realise how, how important it is to understand that. He is himself, complete, doesn't change. He is the image of his Father, including that he doesn't change. His character and the character of the Father and the character of the Holy Spirit are identical and doesn't change. How many of, how many messiahs are there? One. One. Who knows that scripture that there's only one name under heaven by which man might be saved, right? One name. And in English, it makes churches think that all you have to do is sing a lot of songs with the word Jesus in it. You know? Of course, you know better now. <laughs> it's from the Hebrew, so where it says name in English, it actually means Shem. It means one character, one person, and everything that that means. Who can save you? There's lots of Jesuses. Like we say, we have two in this church. You know, but there's only one Jesus who's Messiah. There's only one whose Shem, whose character, unchanging, can save you. And so he is the truth. You can't separate Jesus from the truth or the truth from Jesus. To know him, you have to know the truth. To walk with him, you have to walk in the truth. If you take a mixture or a substitute, well, a substitute, you're dead. A mixture, you're at least confused, but you're certainly in danger. So once you realise you're dealing with a mixture, or if you, once you realise you're dealing with a substitute, run. But even if you realise you're dealing with a mixture that's part true and part fairy tale made up by men, you should probably still run, to be frank. Not away from that, run to the real thing. Never run away from anything. Run to what is right. God's not about fear and running away, but he wants us to run home. Run to him, not away from anything. Does that make sense? I hope so. Anyhow. The more I came to understand this, the more God started to show me from the Old Testament all the things that you've been listening to for years now, making me understand, this is me. This is me. I am myself in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. I'm changed. Like I've been talking about in recent weeks. One person, different sides of the character. You see more of one side of his character at the beginning, at the end, at the second coming, he displays more of his other side of his character, but it's still just one person. We have to look to Israel. We have to look to the Jews for the purpose God created them as a schoolroom, as the crash test dummies for the rest of us. He, he, when he made the covenant with the patriarchs, he said it so that the nations would see and believe in him. The nations. How he deals with the covenant people is for the benefit of the outside the covenant people. Remember? Agape your enemies. Don't only agape those who are in your family or in the church. Or, you know? The whole reason God raised Israel up was so that he would be seen. Everything he does with them points to what he'll do with the church. There's nothing special about Jewish people. They're human beings. Their weaknesses are your weaknesses. What they get wrong, the church gets wrong. But the church tends to look back and say, ha, oh, look stupid, oh, how could they have done that? Whilst doing exactly the same thing. We are led to learn from Israel's mistakes in an effort not to repeat them. But overall, the church does repeat them, and the consequences that fell on historic Israel 
falls on the church in the end, as we've spoken about often. You know, the coming of the Assyrian, the coming of the Babylonian, and particularly for us, like in the New Testament period, the repeat of that, of course, is not just the coming of Babylon, but Babylon the Great, the kingdom of Antichrist. It's just recycles on a grand scale. So instead of only the Jews, now it's the whole world. So we're supposed to learn from them, right? And he taught me what I've shared with you a few times, that in the end, only a remnant are saved. And we'll see from the scripture in a minute why the remnant, the split is about one third, two thirds. One third saved, two thirds lost. Okay? A remnant, a minority. So again, in the church, where all they were going on about was all this triumphalist stuff and how the whole earth was going to be Christian and it'd be a great revival and blah, blah, blah. And God's saying to me, I'm only going to save a remnant. I'm only going to bring out a band of survivors. A gleaning. You know? He used to terrify me with Matthew 7. Many will come on that day saying, Lord, Lord, look at all the things we've done for you. Remember in Hebrew, Lord, Lord, when you repeat a word, is like typing in bold or typing in capitals, texting in capitals, right? So it's when you get Lord, Lord, instead of just Lord, it's like shouting, emphasizing. So are they, do these people have any doubt that Jesus is the Messiah? No. What does he say to them? We don't have a relationship. I don't know you. Bye. You're not coming in. Is it one or two? No, he says many. Why many? Because it's what the Old Testament already says. So you would think, well, you know, it's already gloomy. And if it was just about justice, as we saw in the last couple of weeks, there'd be no hope. God only saved the people who deserve to be saved. Heaven will be empty. None of us do. Compared to each other, we say, oh, that's a good person or a bad person compared to me. Well, they might be. But it won't be me sitting in the judgment seat on judgment day. Who will be sitting in the judgment seat as perfect and without sin? Has never made a mistake, nor can he. You know? So the standard is against him, not me. So we're all good or bad compared to each other, but compared to him, we're all bad. You know, it's a relativity thing. Can we have Einstein in Bible class? I suppose we can. Yeah. Okay. So to remind us of that, we, we will just shoot back to what we did last week, just for a reminder, because it's part of the story. Isaiah, we're on the middle of page two. Isaiah 59, verse 15. Truth is nowhere to be found, and whoever shuns evil becomes a prey. Remember, you become like food for something. The Lord looked and was displeased, he's angry, and there was no justice. He saw that there was no one, and he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him. Remember, that's Jesus, the arm of the Lord. And his own righteousness sustained him. Remember from last week? So God does what's right because it's right. He doesn't take our, our nature into account at all. He just does what's right in his own eyes simply because it's right. And when he says it's right, it's right. He doesn't make mistakes. He defines what's right. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, which you'll recognize from Ephesians 6, the armor of God. He put on the garments of vengeance and wrapped himself in zeal as in a cloak. The garments of vengeance means to save some, he has to destroy others. He says of his people, I've given up nations to have you. If someone's arguing with you about who the rightful original people in Israel are, what's the correct answer? People say, oh, it's the Palestinians. No, it's the Jews. What's the correct answer? 
who are the original inhabitants? And can you meet one today? No. No. Why? Because they give them the land, God exterminated them because they were so wicked. It's the Canaanites. He says, I especially hate them because of their vile practices. That's why he says, you're not to leave any alive. You must purge the land of their evil. So if you're asking who the original inhabitants are, who does the land originally belong to, it's the Canaanites, but good luck trying to give the land back to them because they are extinct. Why? God made them extinct. He gave the land to his people Israel. That's what he means by I've given up nations to have you. God is not afraid to destroy the wicked in order to save those who love him. Where were we? Ah. According to what they had done, so he will repay wrath to his enemies and retribution to his foes. He's talking about ultimate judgment. He will repay the islands their due. From the west, people will fear the name of the Lord. And from the rising of the sun, that's the east, they will revere his glory. For he will come like a pent-up flood that the breath of the Lord drives along as the Holy Spirit of the Ruach. The Redeemer, Jesus, will come to Zion, that's Jerusalem, to those in Jacob, that's unrepentant Israel, who repent of their sins, declares the Lord. Putting out modern language, God is watching. He gets angrier and angrier and angrier and angrier, but he holds his anger back for the sake of those he's trying to save. He refrains from exploding until there's a point in human history where there's nothing else to do. And then when he lets go of his anger, it's the anger of all the centuries let go at once. That's why the end is so terrible. It's his pent up fury of the whole history of mankind. You know, he'll get a bit grumpy now and again and cause, you know, shaking. But this is when he unleashes wrath. That's why the last three and a half years are so appalling. Right? But look what it says. The Redeemer will come back to Zion, Jerusalem, second coming. For those in Jacob, Jewish, who repent, who return to him. We'll see more than what this specifically means uh, in the second, in fact, always next. So I want you to remember that that is who our God is. He's righteous, he's just, he will not let the wicked escape, he does not let sin go unpunished. Somebody has to pay for sin. So for the saved, for those who repent, it's the whole issue of Messiah as they as the uh, sacrificial goat, the Yom Kippur goat. He is the scapegoat. He dies instead of those who really own the sin. He takes their sin upon himself, just as the sins of the nation were ritually placed on the goat at Yom Kippur. Okay? But God requires the law to be fulfilled. Someone has to pay for the sin. So for those who are who, for whose sin is not paid for, look what he says he's going to do. Not a happy day. But he does all this as we look based on his own character and to keep his covenant to save, even though there was no one who deserved it because he promised the patriarchs. He made a promise. How many covenants are there in the Bible that God makes? Nine. Right? He keeps them all. The promise he made to Noah, the promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, goes on and on, right? So he will not let any of them go unfulfilled, none of them. Nothing he has promised will, will fail to be fulfilled, nothing. Right? Nothing. How do we know that so many are going to perish. And what does that mean for us? 
let's have a look. And Zechariah, where is he? Out there. It's your turn. So, especially for Zechariah, we're having Zechariah today. So, we're going to look at Zechariah 12 and 13, which are, they have meaning for his own day, but they also point much specifically to the end of time. So we're going to go in reverse order. We're going to read Zechariah 13 first, verse 7. Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two-thirds will be struck down and perish, yet one-third will be left in it. This third will be put into the fire and I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say, they are my people and they will say, the Lord is our God. Strike the shepherd and all that. We'll look at that in detail in a second, but this is God reaching a point where it's like, enough. That's it. You know? Now this scripture has had multiple fulfillments already. Multiple. Each one is like a dress rehearsal. Each one it's partially fulfilled. Its ultimate expression is the time of Jacob's trouble. Right at the end. We'll come to it in a second. Why does Jesus have to come back to Jerusalem? Zechariah 12 is part of the reason. The Lord will save the dwellings of Judah first, so that the honour of the house of David and of Jerusalem's inhabitants may, be, may not be greater than that of Judah. On that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem. The Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem. Where's Antichrist? Gathering his army on the plains of Megiddo. Armageddon, right, and the Valley of Jezreel. Why? He's, he has Jerusalem under siege. Does he get to go inside the gate? Does he get to kill them? No, why? Zechariah 12. On that day, not any day, but that day, the Lord will shield those who live in Jerusalem so that the feeblest amongst them will be like David. The house of David will be like God like the angel of the Lord going before them. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. When is that ultimately fulfilled? It's what happens at the second coming. It says that all the nations are gathered around Jerusalem intent on wiping out the last of the Jews. And they call upon his name, remember? And that's what brings the second coming. And the armies of Antichrist are destroyed. That's Zechariah 12 being fulfilled. Why do they call on him suddenly after like centuries of shaking their fist at Jesus and calling him everything under the sun? Remember Agape? This is who God is saving. This is the most hard-headed, stubborn people on earth, religious Jews, who hate Jesus. They think he's a fake. They hate anyone who mentions him. They hate Christians. You know? <clears throat> yeah. That's who Jesus is coming to save. Do they deserve it? No. Why is God doing it? To keep a promise. Because he made it. That you're a yes, be yes, and you're a no, no, remember? Keeping a covenant is at the heart of God's character. How does he get them to do this? Here it is in verse 10. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication, and they will look on me, the one they have pierced. Well, who's that? Who did they pierce? Jesus. Jesus. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. Now, I've mentioned this to you many times, but this is where it comes from, right? And as you know already, to grieve the loss of your son, your only child, speaks of the end of your family line. 
your family name will become extinct. So that's what God is saying here. They will weep in the understanding that all things Jewish are about to be no more. You know? Don't worry, lots of horns going. Anyway. But he pours out his spirit on them in grace, gift, supplication. He appeals to them. Suddenly they look upon him who they pierced. Might not seem like much in the words, but what do you use to look? Eyes. Eyes, right? Where have we seen this before? On a certain road. Who was blind then suddenly saw? Shaul of Tarsus, who was persecuting the church, remember? Rabbi Shaul. On the, on the road to Emmaus, he's blinded. Who blinds him? Jesus. Remember? Jesus confronts him. Why, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He's terrified and he loses his sight. But then God by the Holy Spirit, gives him his sight back and he becomes the greatest of the apostles. His repentance is greater than anybody's. He goes from God's greatest enemy to God's best friend. That's what this is getting at. It's when they are, same as what happened to Paul, it's when their eyes are opened by the Holy Spirit and the conviction of the truth comes upon them so powerfully that this last group of Jews alive anywhere in the world, who are all in there under siege in Jerusalem, their eyes are open, and they realize, they all realize what they have done to their own Messiah. And they weep because they don't think, that, oh, this is why God's doing this to us, because we've murdered the Messiah. That's why they're weeping. Imagine that. Imagine you think you're God's people and then God shows you at the last minute that you've murdered your own saviour. How are you going to be feeling now? <laughs> like you're about to become extinct. Because the enemy's at the gate. You can't do anything about it. You can't save yourself. And now God, who you're calling on, has just told you what you're really like and what you've done to his son. But they repent. Remember what we read before from Isaiah? That the Redeemer will come to those in Jerusalem who repent. And because they repent, he saves them. In page three, we need to look at how this, these scriptures, they, they say some things we need to understand for ourselves. Oh, just before I go there, remember I said that it's had multiple fulfillments? So what about in the time of Jesus? Does it happen in the time of Jesus? Yes, AD 70. The Roman Empire surrounds them. Two thirds or more die. Only a remnant. The city's destroyed, the temple's destroyed, and only a remnant come out. How many Christians die? Zero. Why? Because the Holy Spirit told them to leave the city a couple of days before. And no one understood why all the Christians were filing out of the city. It was more miraculous than you think because the Roman army was already outside. And for a reason that no one can explain in any human terms, the Roman army, who was supposed to be having them under siege, just let them go. Like through the Red Sea, like Moses through the Red Sea. The Christians were able to just leave the city and walk through the Roman army to freedom. Those that stayed in the city mostly died. More than a million people. They say that the blood was ankle deep in the streets. The Roman soldiers just went berserk. Killed everyone, men, women, children, and most importantly, killed all the priests. The same ones that had crucified Jesus. You know, the Sanhedrin died. God put them to the sword. 
right? Who sent the Roman army? God. But it's not the fulfillment of this. It's not the only scripture. That's another whole topic. But it's a it's one of the foreshadowings. One of the foreshadowings. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. Who is the shepherd? He who goes first, and the sheep follow. Right? Who is the shepherd? Jesus. Jesus. When he is struck, pointing to the crucifixion, crucifixion yeah, what happens to the flock? What happened to his disciples when he's arrested? They all go with him? And they all ran in all directions. Can't stop what the scripture says. Strike the shepherd and the flock will be scattered. They had to be gathered back. Even Peter, remember Peter says, everyone else will run, but not me, Lord. Not me. Remember by dawn, he denied him three times. Everybody runs, right? Because the enemy, when the enemy really comes, the enemy is no joke. Right? When the shepherd is struck, the sheep are scattered. When the enemy comes, ultimately, how is Jesus struck in our day? You know, at the end, in the, in the New Testament time. How does this have its ultimate fulfillment? You have to remember what else the shepherd is. He is the truth, the way, the Lord. You know? So how does Antichrist and Satan, who is, well, he's also, Jesus is also the light. So when Antichrist and Satan come, they are darkness. They are lies. They are not the way. They are, they are a deception, an alternate way. How is Jesus... <coughs> Struck? You're watching it on your news on your TV right now. You're watching Jesus being struck every day. Every time the spiritual force behind what you call cancel culture and the liberal movement and all these many, many party faces and wears, it's just the spirit of Antichrist. What is it doing? hammering and hammering and hammering at the truth, at the light, at the way in order to scatter the flock. And is the flock being scattered? Yeah. Those that don't care because they don't love the truth, they're all not very bothered. But the real Christians, when you meet them, are often a bit of a mess. You keep meeting them, they all think they're the last Christian on the planet, you know? They're like, oh, I couldn't stay in my church. I thought there was the only one left, which is also from Scripture, by the way. The real disciples are always scattered out of the churches. They can't stay in the temple. They can't stay in Jerusalem. They have to get out. How do they, why do they have to get out? God calls them. They're led out. The same thing always happens again. In the end, it gets so bad that those other things you already know, but I'll just quickly remind you of. When Remember the wilderness is a, an exodus, is a picture of your human life, right? So you've left Egypt, your old sinful life, but you're not yet in the kingdom. So what happens in the wilderness is a picture of your own life and also the history of man, right? The, the process on the way to the kingdom. The bread representing Jesus, representing the word. Remember he says, I am the bread of life, I am the true bread. Your fathers ate manna in the desert. I am what that represents, I am the true bread. That's what he's saying, right? That's what, remember he says, you have to eat me. He's the word of God, you have to take him in. We've done all this a lot lately, right? What's the rule for picking up the manna in the desert? You've got six days. Each week, you're allowed to pick it up for only six days. Why? Because no bread fell on the seventh day. So on the sixth day, they were commanded to pick up twice as much as usual. 
enough for the sixth day and enough for the seventh day because none would fall on the seventh day. There would be no bread on the last day. Now a week always, remain, always refers to, goes back to the book of Daniel, the 70 weeks of Daniel, like referring to the whole of human history. So this is the last day of the last week is the ultimate fulfillment of this. In other words, the very, very end of human history. No bread will fall. You know the Lord's Prayer? Give us this day our daily bread. But on our sixth day, Lord, give us twice as much because we know that at the end, no bread will fall. And he's not talking about food. Remember our friends, the five wise and the five unwise virgins? What's, what made the five wise ones wise? They got their oil during the day. The unwise waited till it was already night. Then they couldn't find it. They struggled to find any. It's the same picture again. So as the end comes, we're supposed to be twice as interested in taking the word in as usual. You know, on the sixth day, get twice as much because the time will come when we won't be able to do this. The time will come if where you if you're looking for the word of God, you won't be able to get it. Remember what the unwise virgins say to the wise? Give us some of your oil. What do the wise virgins say? Sorry, we've only got enough for ourselves. You know? It's scary, eh? It's meant to be scary. It will be even more scary when it's unfolding, right? All of these different scriptures all point to the same thing. That when the shepherd is struck and the sheep is scattered, the word will eventually get harder and harder to obtain and then impossible to obtain. When the seventh day representing the end, the end, the end of things you will not be able to receive the word at all. Remember the restrainer? When Antichrist comes, God has to have the restrainer who restrains him step back. Who restrains the spirit of Antichrist? The Holy Spirit. When it's time for Antichrist to have his day, the Holy Spirit steps back. He no longer works in the world. He only remains present in believers you know, so he doesn't leave us. He doesn't work in the world anymore. There's no more gifts of the Spirit. There's no more evangelism. There's no more Bible stuff, you know, because the Holy Spirit withdraws from all of that. All of that stops. Does that make sense? What about the next thing which says, two-thirds will be struck down and perish yet one-third will be left in it. This third I will put into the fire. I will refine them like silver and test them like gold. This has also had a number of foreshadowings, not least something that's been coming up a lot lately is the Holocaust. Who's familiar with the Holocaust? So now this two third, one third ratio. So who who mass murdered the Jews in World War Two? It's two faces of one evil. Everyone knows about the Nazis, right? Does anyone know what Nazi stands for? National Socialist Party. They're socialists, like the Labour Party. Their equivalent in Russia, who have the same policies, the Germans said you were doing it for the fatherland. In Russia, you said you were doing it for the motherland. In Germany, you had Adolf Hitler. In Russia, you had Joseph Stalin. But their policies were basically identical. Communist. The Russian version is the communists. People think that the Nazis and the communists are opposite, two opposite things. They're not. Yeah, They're all one thing. The They're two different, <coughs> two different faces, but it's one thing, right? Between the Nazis and Stalin, 
was anyone like to hazard a guess what percentage of all of Europe's Jews were killed? Two thirds. Two thirds of all the Jews in Europe died at the hand of an antichrist empire in two halves, the Russians and the Germans. We don't hear about the Russian stuff so much because it was inconvenient to talk about it because they were supposed to be our allies. But the Russians killed as many Jews as the Nazis and, and kept doing it for years after. What happened to the one third? What does it say there? This third I'll put into the fire and I'll refine them like silver and test them like gold. The third that escaped, they just go to the beach? No? What's their history been like ever since? Testing, testing, refining, trial upon trial upon trial. Testing and refining them. Look at the history of Israel. This is fulfillment of this, right? It's just a foreshadowing. World War II and what happened is just a foreshadowing of the ultimate event. The ultimate event is what we read in Zechariah. The one third who are under trial and tested are the one third who survive what's called the time of Jacob's trouble, which ends in the siege of Jerusalem where that third who are all that's left, they are the remnant. They're all that's left from the trial. The trials kill two thirds of them. Only one third remain. Right? It's much worse than what happened in World War II. Vastly worse. How do I know that? Because scripture says that. It says when it's when the time of Jacob's trouble is spoken about by Jeremiah, it says there will no, there will never be anything like this before it or after it. It says specifically in the scripture that it will be the worst event ever in history. Ever. So it will make what happened in World War II look like a picnic. Again, you want to listen to God and obey him because the, he will deal with his enemies. Then he says, they will call on my name and they will say, they are my people. And they will say, the Lord is our God. Exodus 6, you'll find almost at the bottom of page 3 in the box. Therefore, this is the Passover promises. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. And the last promise, I will make you as my own people, and I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord, your God. I'll be your God, and you will be my people. Remember when we did Passover, the four cups? This is the fourth cup, right? Remember Jesus, he drank that, and then he says, I'll not drink this again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. That's what he means. Next time we're sharing this, I'll have fulfilled that. That's what he means. Turning over to page four. We need to speed up a bit. So, I'll put a little warning in here. It's not a political lesson. I hate politics. It's got no time for it. But we must understand, especially you younger ones who will be under heaps of pressure to be modern and go along with all the smiley Jacinda stuff and all that, Understand the spirit behind it is what is striking the shepherd. What is trying to tear away the Christian foundations of New Zealand society and every society. It is your enemy. Just because it wears a smiley, a smiley face doesn't make it any less anti your eternity. So don't buy into it. Only politicians, anyway, so it's perfectly easy to ignore. They have no fear of God. Why is it important to have a proper, healthy respect for the fact that God is to be feared? He's merciful and kind and all those things, but He is properly to be feared because imagine if you were the two thirds, you know, 
Remember what he says he's going to do to his enemies in the end? You don't want to be them. He is to be treated, you know, with respect. Like a hand grenade that eventually the pin's going to come out. You know, and you're asked to hold it. You better hang on to it properly. <laughs> you know? Why is fear of him so vital? What does fear of the Lord give you? Wisdom. What is wisdom, by the way? Knowing what to do with knowledge. Exactly. What's that saying? Ah, oh, knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in your fruit cellar. <laughs> Because ask any botanist, tomato is a fruit, you know, but don't put it in your fruit salad. Some coop probably does, but you know, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Not, knowledge is knowledge, wisdom is knowing what to do with that knowledge, right? God says, get wisdom, gain understanding, get wisdom, right? It's not enough to understand, you need to know what to do. But now, as we look at Daniel 12, which speaks in the very end, right? God, Jesus is speaking to Daniel. This is the, almost the end of the book of Daniel, right? Look what he says. Go your own way, Daniel, because the words are rolled up and sealed until the end, until the time of the end. In other words, he's saying what I've just told you is to do at the end of days. Look what it says next. Many will be purified, made spotless and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. When you lose your fear of God, you lose the prospect of biblical wisdom. You will not understand what's happening. You'll be swept along with Antichrist. You'll end up in the worst place. So when you see these politicians and that, so openly boasting against Christianity and so openly dismissing as if God was just a joke. They are sorry for them. They don't know what they're doing. After a while, they go completely blind. They will not understand. They'll go on being wicked until it's too late. Too late. Zechariah 12, down the middle of page 4, the bits in the middle you can read for yourself. On that day, I will set out to destroy all the nations that attack Jerusalem. I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child. Grieve, and bit uh, grieve bitterly for him as one grieves. A firstborn son. It says that they will, uh, that all who call upon the name of the Lord, I cut it off too early, sorry, it's in the same place, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So once this happens, the scripture that goes with that, which for some reason I didn't put, don't worry, um, it says that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. All Israel will be saved. And I think you know this already. When God calls them Jacob, remember Jacob and Israel are the same person? It's only when Jacob repents and humbles himself and submits himself to God that he gets his new name, Israel. So Jacob has to repent. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. But all Israel it's saved. It's the repentance of that one third because God gives them the grace to repent, opens their eyes. He stops calling them Jacob. He calls them Israel. He acknowledges them as being in the covenant again with him. And they are saved. All Israel is saved. Doesn't mean the land of Israel, two thirds will have died. 
unfortunately you get people in the church who think it means, you know, like geographical Israel. Oh, God will save Israel. Not if you mean the country. He's already said that two thirds will die. He means what it means biblically. Make sure you understand that. When they call upon the name of the Lord, what does that mean? Does it mean they just, like in Pentecostal church, where you just stick in Jesus' name on the end of everything, like a magic spell? No, it has a Hebrew meaning. But you know the Shema, like the Jewish version of the Lord's Prayer? Shema Yisrael, you know? So the second line is, Baruch Shem Kavod Makotola Alav Ve'ed. Blessed is the name, not his name, the name. Hashem. Hashem. The name. That's, Jews are scared to pronounce the name of God for fear of taking it in vain, so they never use his name. They refer to him as Hashem, the name. The Shem, meaning his whole character. That's what this means here, when they call upon his Shem meaning his specific character when they acknowledge the truth, when they acknowledge who Jesus really is. They are saying. So you ask yourself, well, that's all Jewish, right? That's all what happens to them at the end. What's it got to do with us? Because aren't we gone? Well, yeah. We're not here. For the, for the time of Jacob's trouble, we're not here. This is to do with God pouring out his wrath. We're not appointed to wrath, but we are appointed to philipsis, tribulation. Okay? So we and them go through tribulation. Then the rapture happens and takes the church away, whether you're Jew or Gentile. So long as you're in the covenant, as long as you're Christian according to Jesus, then whether you were born Jewish or born Gentile, it doesn't matter a jot. It's those who are in covenant with him. Bang, gone. Rapture, the word harpezo, means to violently snatch away. So you won't just like, you know, float up like a hot air balloon. It's one minute you're there and then bang, all the Christians on the whole earth are gone. Like that. And it'll be fairly shocking for anyone watching it from the ground. That's why airlines don't have two pilots. Yeah. yeah, it's true. United Airways back in the 60s, yeah. they wouldn't let two, two um, born again Christians fly a plane, fly an airline. TWA. For fear of the rapture. Yeah. But really? Because yeah. they thought, well, you know what's silliest about that? If you're still on the plane, Crashing into the ground is the least of your worries. <laughs> if you've been left behind, dying in a plane crash is the least of your worries. Anyway, why is it so important? Well, firstly, what I'm paid for, it's a mistake to think that God will treat us any different than he treats the Jews because he's impartial and he's unchanging and Jesus removed the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile, all right? He treats every human being the same. One way of salvation, one Messiah, one truth, one narrow way, one door, one covenant, his terms. My way or the highway, you know? Secondly, all these things tell us that God's character and therefore that of Jesus is identical and just because he's the Lamb of God we have to remember he's also the Lion of Judah so it's very important for us to remember that the closer we get to that end of the time scale the more he starts to reveal the other side of his nature because he returns as the Lion of Judah so Jesus will start to act less and less like, you know, gentle Jesus, the Lamb of God, and more and more like in the likeness of David, you know? The Lion of Judah, who comes to work justice and to avenge 
and to fulfill everything else that God has said. The scary stuff. It's still Jesus. Why is it important for us to understand that? Because otherwise you might be suckered into thinking, Oh Lord, where have you gone? Don't you know this is happening? What's he going to say to you? Who do you think is making it happen? It's me. Because he is gentle and kind, but he is righteous and just. He fulfills the whole of scripture, not just the fluffy bits. You can't do pick and mix on God's word. <laughs> Thanks Lord, your word is awesome. I'll have that bit and that bit. But I don't like this. I don't like these ones. You know. Yeah. Do you know what God says about his own word? Every time you see every time you see someone like Ezekiel, that God gives him the word of God on a scroll, he sees himself being given it on a scroll, then he, the angel tells him to eat the scroll. Why? <clears throat> Meaning take the word in. They, the prophets always say the same thing. When I ate it, it was sweet in my mouth, but it was bitterness in my stomach. Because when it really gets in, it tastes like, yeah, Christianity, yummy. But then when it really lands in the stomach, and like the truth, like the awkward, uncomfortable, disturbing truth of what this means, it's like, oh, that feels so good now. My stomach is very disturbed. God's brutally honest about, you know, anything, everything. So, what else does it mean for us? Firstly, don't worry when these things happen. It's still Jesus. He's still in control because it's, he's just starting to show more and more the other side of his character. What about the death of the two-thirds? Has that got any meaning for us? Because remember, it's specific and final, ultimate expression is what happens to the Jews in Israel, and particularly leaving just the one third in Jerusalem. Well, that's all the Jews, is not it? Has got any meaning for us? Yes. Remember how the Jews come first to teach us what will happen in the church? What happens in history as it goes into reverse? God starts to foreshadow what will happen to Israel, to the Jews at the end. He starts to foreshadow it with how he deals with the church at the end of the church. Does that make sense? So remember, he first dealt with Israel to teach us what would happen with the church. So in that order, Jews first, Gentiles second. But as the time of the church comes to a close, the age of the Gentiles, as it's called, comes to a close, God starts to deal with the church the same way as he's going to deal with the Jews. He deals with us first. But the way he deals with us foreshadows what will happen to the Jews. So they went first last time, we go first this time. Why? We're witnesses. Any smart Jew watching what happens to the church should go, wait, this is a sign. You know, repent now. Most don't, but that's what God's intention is, right? So we should see something that foreshadows that two-thirds dying that happens in the church, and it is the great apostasia. It's called the great falling away, where the love of most, more than half, will grow cold. Their faith will die. Right? That is the... Christian version, the foreshadowing of what will happen in the Jewish world. Just as most Jews will die, most Christians, or well, most church people, will give up. They won't persevere because of the increase of wickedness. They'll go cold, which is a Jewish way of saying they'll spiritually die. Right? <clears throat> so it has every meaning for us, especially since this time we'll go first. Right? If you're a real Christian, if you're the one third, what do you lesson do you have to take from that? Firstly, do your best to make sure that no one you care about is in the two thirds. If they don't know and you see and God prompts you, talk to them. Go talk to them. 
do what you can. They might not listen. It's better that you went and talked to them and they didn't listen than that they perished because you didn't talk to them. Right? But more importantly, or as importantly, more as importantly, when you see it all happening in front of you, it does not mean God is failing. It means God is keeping his word. Jesus is not banished. Jesus is driving it. Remember, he fulfills the scripture. All of it. He doesn't just cherry pick the nice bit. So when you're wondering where Jesus is when all this is happening, remind yourself, Jesus is causing the word of the living God to be fulfilled. All of it. So he hasn't vanished. He's right there, as ever. And he's still in charge, as ever. He never stops being himself. How about the tribulation? Well, we covered this briefly a second ago, but the tribulation, the philipsis, in the, in the Greek, there's two separate words for tribulation and wrath. Philipsis and orge. We are not appointed to wrath. The Jews are. When I say the Jews, I mean those who are not Jewish Christians. I mean those who have stubbornly remained, you know. But what happens to us foreshadows the time of Jacob's trouble. It's just it's nowhere near as extreme. Then because Jeremiah is told that at that time there will be no time like it before or again. So the Jewish version is extreme beyond extreme beyond extreme. It is the worst time ever that ever will be. But the tribulation is still bad. You know, because it's designed for the same purpose. The tribulation causes the two thirds to disappear. The, the time of Jacob's trouble is what kills the two thirds of Jews. The tribulation is what causes the two-thirds of the church to give up and effectively die. <clears throat> it's just nowhere near as intense as what's coming after. How come we're not here for when it gets really bad? Jesus said, if the time had not been cut short, how many would survive? None. Therefore, the time is cut short so that his people survive. Who? The remnant. No numbers are given, but of God being God, it could well be the, the two-third, one-third ratio again. Boy knows, he says, many will fall away, and the Greek word is at the top end of many. So it may well be two-thirds of church people just give up and stop being. How do they give up, by the way? There's two ways you can give up. You can give up in the obvious way, which is like literally just give up and say, oh, no, I used to go to church, don't anymore. I used to believe in God, don't anymore. There's that kind. Then there's the more scary kind who st say they are still Christians, but what they believe and what they do and what they say is like not from any Bible you want to be reading. They are those who end up as part of the Antichrist's Christian element. Because remember, the final one world religion includes people who call themselves Christians but aren't. Either way, you don't want to be them. So, very important to understand that that time is coming for us at nowhere near the intensity as it's going to be for. Does anyone know why the intensity is much less? Like literally why? Who are we troubled by in the tribulation? Who troubles us? If we're really in Christ, who troubles us? Antichrist and his servants. Right? Who troubles the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble? Is it still Satan? It's gone. The tribulation, the enemy giving us grief, is the enemy. But when it turns to wrath, it, Satan as well is on the receiving end. Antichrist as well is on the receiving end. 
the, when you look in the book of Revelation, when the, the, when the bowls of God's wrath have been poured out onto the earth, it's been poured out onto the wicked, onto Antichrist and all who follow him. It's God that's pouring out his fury directly on the earth and everything in it. That's why it's so much more frightening than when it's only some demon having a go at you. Remember, Antichrist and demonic beings and their human servants cannot go beyond the limit that God permits them. So if you really belong to Christ, it's like you read in the book of Job, you can be troubled, but they can't take your life. You know, Jesus says, I hold in my hand, no one can snatch you from me. They can trouble you, but they can't have you unless you give them unless you give yourself to them. Right? Listen, don't back down. Don't change your mind. Don't give up. How about perseverance? Jesus said those who persevere will be saved. Right? Matthew ten twenty two, you'll be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. It's the same deal. Those who don't turn back, those who are left at the end after the tribulation are just like those who are left at the end, the time of Jacob's trouble. Everything that is going to happen to the Jews will be foreshadowed in our slightly watered down way. But that's us. Just conscious of the times, so I'm going to speed up. That big box there about Goma, there's a class of people, I've talked about this before, Goma from the book of Hosea represents people who are who are, were once in covenant with him, once betrothed to Christ, who have given themselves to another husband. So they've given themselves to like the Toronto blessing. They've given themselves to New Apostolic Reformation or Oh Jamie sent me this clip from Bethel Church the other day to know whether laugh or cry. It's just appalling. You should share it around. You'll not believe what they're doing. Anyway, but anyway, out of those people who are spiritually dead as a doorknob, right, they are following demons. Nevertheless, just as, remember how I said everything that happens to us foreshadows what happens to the Jews? That one third is pictured by Goma and Hosea. God redeems and rescues Goma in spite of what she is. Not because of what she is, in spite of what she is. The first thing he does to her is he makes all of her lovers, in other words, the world, everything she gets her, what she thinks she needs from, he makes them turn on her until she's left praying for death. And she says, I was better off with my real husband. That foreshadows I will look upon, they will look upon the one they have pierced, right? We were better off with our real Messiah. We will see a foreshadowing in the church of what happens in Jerusalem at the end. I'm quite convinced that just as he foreshadows everything else, he'll also do this. That the Gomers, I don't know how many, but you know, a, a remnant out of those people he will crush them. He will give them their own mini version of the time of Jacob's trouble until their pride and their arrogance and everything that presently means when you or I try and talk to them, they just laugh in your face. Right? But in spite of that, for his name's sake, for his covenant's sake, you know, driven by his righteousness and to demonstrate that I'm God, not you, sunshine, he will go with them. So never give up on those people. Everything in scripture points to that being a righteous expectation that even some of those people God will bring back to make it as a matter of promise, as a matter of covenant. Even while the two thirds are falling away. Okay? You can read that at home. Let's shoot over. I'm going to have to go a little bit over time, sorry, but because we're not having anything next week. I'll just try and go fast. So our last part is, what about sifting? 
Order sifting and bakers. Grace. Sifting. What's sifting? Ah. Oh. Like sifting flour, right? How does a, how does sifting work? How does sifting work? Um, it's caught in the sieve. So let me put it to you this way. The, the one doing the sifting put something in the way that some things can pass and other things can't pass. It causes separation. Okay? Separation. So, on page six, coming back to the personal testimony thing, I don't think I've ever shared this before, but we see there Ezekiel, oh, sorry, yeah, Ezekiel 2, Ezekiel 3, and Jeremiah 1. Those are the three scriptures that me and my room in Island Bay in about 1991, I think, God freaked me right out, made me read these scriptures, and said, this is what I'm saying to you. And that's when he started sending me to those leaders that wouldn't listen. The same leaders that were oppressing me, the same leaders that were mistreating me, he said, you are the one that has to go and speak to them. And you, I'll just give you one little example. We'll go straight down to Jeremiah 1, because the, the other two are just echo it, okay? But you can read it at home yourself. Get yourself ready, stand up, and say to them whatever I command you. <clears throat> at the time I thought, yeah, okay, Lord. <laughs> Boy, do I regret that. Anyway, do not be terrified by them, or I will terrify you before them. Today I have made you a fortified city, an iron pillar, a bronze wall to stand against the whole land, against the kings of Judah and its officials, its priests and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but will not overcome you, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the war. Well, I, the Lord, I can testify that God absolutely kept that to this day. In fact, some of them have complained to me you never stop. Well, the truth doesn't change. You know, and whatever they do to shut me down, nothing affects you. Yes, it does. But you can't push me over because to push me over is to try and push over the message that I'm sent with. It's not my message, it's his message. And he promised that though you will fight against me, and they do, you won't win. Because he's not with you. He's with his word. I'm just a postman. This is nothing about me. This is about him. He's kept this promise. You can read the other two from Ezekiel that basically say the same thing, which is go and tell them whatever they whatever I tell you, even though they won't listen to you. Even though they won't listen to you. That's in Ezekiel three, you read that. And he says the same thing. Even though they fight back against you, I'll make you like an immovable object that they can't shut. I tell you right now, God has kept his word on that. Why is that important? Because just as he said, after 20-something years, when you feel like giving up, and you know, I said to the Lord, what's the point, Lord? They won't listen. They don't listen. Because he told me to go again. This is about a year ago. And I honestly, I'm confessing now. I said to the Lord, Why? What's the point? They don't listen. That's when he reminded me of this. He says, yeah, I know. I told you that at the beginning. <laughs> I told you right from day one that they wouldn't listen. But I told you. Go and say to them whatever I tell you. Not just words I hear in my head. Scripture. You know? And guess what? They're not going to listen to you this time either. So this time, it was about a year ago, this time, I, I sent them exactly the scripture that God said. Pretty scary stuff. And then I added, and I know you're not going to listen. 
where God says, I'll just tell you anyway. And guess what? They didn't listen. They didn't listen. But straight away after that, God sent me to Jeremiah 9. I'm going to flip straight to page 7 now. Because the rest, you can read the rest at home. Jeremiah 9 is really important because it speaks of what's happening around us now. This is God having a moan to Jeremiah, right? This is God having an honesty moment with Jeremiah. So God speaking in the first person about himself here. He says, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears. I would weep day and night for the slain of my people. Oh, that I had in the desert a lodging place for travellers, so that I might leave my people and go away from them. For they are all adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. And he was telling me, these people that won't listen to what I send you with, that's how I see them. What's God saying? God, right, who's scared of nothing, what's he saying? I wish I could just go somewhere and hide. These people are impossible. You know, this is God talking. He says, I wish I could just cry and cry and cry for the slain of his people. Why? The activity of these false teachers has caused the spiritual death of countless people. Remember, false teachers are like mass murderers in God's book. The slain of his people. God wants to weep himself to sleep. And he says, if I had a, you know, if I had a bug out place in the desert, I'd go there. I'd just hide. I'd just pretend you guys didn't exist. That's how he's feeling. That's what he says. That's what he's saying to me at the same time. Well, that was a revelation. A real revelation. Because truth be known, I was thinking exactly the same thing. I had enough of these guys. I really can't do this anymore. And, and God was saying, yeah, I know. You're feeling that because I'm feeling that. You know? Then it goes on. Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says. See, I will refine and test them. I'm going to pass them through the sieve. I will refine and test them. For what else can I do because of the sin of my people? Do you get that? God is at the end of his rope. You wonder why God has to do the scary stuff? Why he has to do the goma stuff where he like crush people until they finally break? It's not because he's mean or malicious or like a cat playing with a mouse. It's this. It's because we, the, the church, and these guys in particular, and men like, people like them, have driven God to the point where no matter who he sends, no matter what he does, no matter, they just won't listen, and they're killing his people. To the point that he'd like to just give up himself and hide, but he can't. It's not in his nature. So he says here, what else can I do? What does he mean? I haven't got anything left. All that's left, all I've got left, is the scary stuff. I'm going to push you through the sieve. I'm going to cause you the Gomer experience, you know, where you're going to wish you were dead if you're not one, if you're one of these people. I'm going to put you in the blast furnace where you're either going to be refined by it or turned into a pile of ash because there's nothing left. Everything else, all the easy ways, you won't listen. And he could just abandon them, but he won't. Remember about Goma? Remember about the, the remnant of Jacob, the links he goes to? All that scary stuff in Revelation just to get one third of the remaining Jews to finally repent? Or he could have just left them. He'd be perfectly right to do so, wouldn't he? He'd be perfectly just. Be justice isn't enough for God. 
is a covenant to keep, a promise to keep. Then he says, in Jeremiah 7, where he took me next, there's a couple of boxes down. So do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them. Do not plead with me, because I won't listen to you. Do you not see what they're doing in the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem? The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough and make cakes to offer to the Queen of Heaven. That's also referred to in Revelation concerning Antichrist. They pour out drink offerings to other gods, little g, demons, to arouse my anger. But am I the one they are provoking, declares the Lord? Are they not rather harming themselves to their own shame? God is saying, as angry as he is, he's overwhelmed with concern because this is suicide, what they're doing. They're destroying themselves. What does that mean? If I'm right about this, I'm pretty sure I am. We are very likely to see things happen in the church where God, basically, patience runs out. Where he will confront all of that garbage and give people a live or die kind of ultimatum. You know, put them through circumstances where it's, you're going to be mine, and then you've got no choice, you must go through this narrow gate and go now. You know? Or, that's it, you're gone. You know? Which means it'll be unpleasant to look at. And it could be people that you know. In fact, I know lots of your friends who are probably not saved, even though they go to church-ish, kind of. Right? Could be some of them. Why is God doing this to them? To save them. Remember what he says? I haven't got anything left. This is all I've got left. This is the last ditch effort to save them because they won't listen. So it's important for you to understand if you see it happening that this isn't God turning on them to destroy them. This is God turning on them to save them. To bring them to their repentance. How will they know that? We all tell them. Do you understand? You'll be the one. If he puts you there, someone like that, you're his mouthpiece. You'll be the one to explain to them. God's looking for your repentance. This isn't happening because he's given up on you. This is happening because he hasn't given up on you. But this is all you've left him since you wouldn't listen. See how important it is to be seeing it from his perspective? Almost done. Luke 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that after that your faith may not fail, and when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Who's Simon? Shimon? Peter. Peter. Right. Peter's going, not me, Lord, not me. Jesus gives him the good news. No, no, no. Satan is going to sift, puts you to the test, you know, trials. He's going to sift all of you. Guess what? All of you includes all of us. This is the disciples that are sifted. But what does he say? I've prayed for you. You won't fail. The sifting will be to refine you. The same sifting that will destroy those who fall away will refine. Remember what God said? The two thirds who die but the one third I will refine. So the same experience, the same things that go on in our world, the same everything that goes on is for two purposes. It'll destroy the wicked and it will refine the remnant. Yeah. Oh yeah. The wheat is the harvest that is after. Okay, and turning over that last page, lucky last. So the sifting is designed to separate. 
the trials, all of that is designed to separate the rubbish from what's to be kept. You understand? It applies amongst people, but it applies also to you, the parts of you that aren't going to heaven. The sifting is sanctification on the volume turned up. You know, where God will cause us to go through things to force us to get real serious about being real. Where he just will require the bad bits to be blown off. And if you cling onto them too hard, he'll stick you back in the blast furnace a bit longer till you can't hold on to it. You know? Refining. Those he saves, he refines. But it'll be the same experiences going on in the world, the same, you know, wars and famines and COVID and everything else. But it's God trying to save the remnant and refine those he's saving. If you can understand it from his perspective, you'll understand that it's all agape. It's not emotion-based. It's God impartially applying his promise to keep a covenant, to keep the promise of everything he's ever said, every word that's proceeded from his mouth, he will keep. The happy stuff and the scary stuff. The Lamb of God stuff and the Lion of Judah stuff. For those that get wise, <laughs> get on the program, return with all their heart, mind and strength, it's salvation. The same thing, the same events for those who refuse to get of them, hard on their hearts, remember. It's death of the worst kind. Very last scripture, bottom of page eight. Luke 22, he says to his disciples, You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom just as my Father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So they're judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's only for the twelve apostles. But the rest of it's for all of us. What is it? Who gets to do this? Those who stood by him in his trials. When the shepherd is struck, his sheep don't run away. They might run for a minute, but then they come back like Peter. They won't listen to another voice, remember? They endure the trials with him. They embrace the correction. They make use of it for their good and for their sanctification. While everyone else is going, oh no, it's the end of the world. You know, go and get drunk, whatever. <clears throat> you understand now? So, what has God told me most recently about those people that are still such a burden to me. Spoke to me from Habakkuk. He said, wait for it. It will surely come. They don't know what's coming because they don't believe. It's probably going to get very, very ugly. Another Salvation Army call closed down last week. I don't many. They're almost broke and they're running out of offices. They still don't get it. They still don't understand. You know? But here's the thing, especially if you're Sally watching. It's happening because God is trying to open their eyes and make them realize you're off the path. He's doing it to try and save them. But if they don't listen in the end, it's over. Does that make me happy? Hell no. And it's not just the Sally's. That's only, I'm only saying that because that's my personal testimony. But it's everywhere, every denomination. It's global. Hear about Carl Lentz? Super Christian, super guru, spiritual advisor to Justin Bieber. Or how Justin Bieber, not. He's just been fired from Hillsong, mm. having an affair. 
betraying his marriage. So the great super Christian turns out to be, you know, a rat. People say, oh, well, what's that? why is that important? Well, it's because of part of what God says, I haven't included in the scriptures here, but what God says is, I'm going to lift your skirt up over your head and cause all nations to see you. What does he mean? I'm going to reveal what you really are. You, won't, you can't hide when God decides to expose what's really going on. You can't hide. So maybe what's happened with Carl is just the beginning of more and more of that. Who will see it? The wise. The wicked will go on being wicked, remember. That it'll be lost on them. But those who are going to be saved will realise and run back to him. Okay, so no art fellowship next week. Dedicating babies instead. And then part two in two weeks, and then am I right, the week after that is wedding. So no art fellowship again the week after that because we'll all be at a wedding. <laughs> Memo to Holly. Wedding in two weeks. Three weeks. <laughs> Think two though, then you'll be in, then you'll be ready in time for three. Yeah, look happier about now. Yeah, that's it. Okay. Please read through this. I know it's a bit. Thanks for your patience, but it's important that we understand these things because the overarching principle in all of this is if we can be prepared by understanding what he has said will actually happen. We won't be shaken when it does. You will be refined by it instead of destroyed. So on that cheerful note, <laughs> cheerful note, remember, I've checked, the, I've checked the last chapter, I know who wins. Jesus wins. I was watching YouTube the other day and this Israeli pastor began a sermon by saying, news flash from Jerusalem, tomb found empty. <laughs> no, he is risen. Okay, so learn these things, understand them, but don't lose heart. It's our Jesus who wins. Okay, we'll win with him. With that in mind, Father, we thank you. We bless you. We ask you, Lord, that you continue to make us wise, that you teach us, that you give us your Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth, write your law on our hearts and minds. Give us knowledge but give us wisdom to go with it Lord that we might be found faithful even until the end even through all refining and every kind of opposition we pray and ask Lord that you would empower us and anoint us to be your witnesses I especially pray Lord for the younger generation in this country everywhere who've been betrayed by my generation who haven't told them the truth from the scripture but given them a pack of lies in many cases Lord talked about a Jesus who wasn't Jesus at all and told them things that will destroy them unless they're corrected we pray and ask Lord that in your anger Lord you would remember to have mercy on those who don't know any better we pray for them Lord we ask that the truth would go and find them that the truth would set them free that you gather them back that all those who were scattered when your word was struck would be gathered back to you, found by you, be gathered back and led out to safety, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good night. Shalom.